Welcome back to The Lookout. I'm here with Junie Bedane, and um, she called me up because she wanted to talk to me about the Keldor fire and the, um, the fire effects and the severity and everything else. And so I've been looking forward to it and thought we'd just record it and then uh, share it with the world. And um, I, I think we're both gonna share it with the world, right? What are you, how are we yeah. doing? So, so I'm a part of um, an organization called the Echo Lakes Environment Fund. Um, which sort of tries to take care of the environment in the Echo Lakes Basin, which was very affected during the Calder fire um, right on Echo Summit there. So there's a lot of folks that have homes in that area, but then also cabins um, and people who are interested in how we should be interacting with that land now that we're going back into like a burned space. Um, and so we have this newsletter, a publication that comes out annually, um, and we wanted to put some information in there about that. Um, so yeah, thank you for being willing to have this conversation. Um, and I was thinking of sort of going chronologically, like understanding first why this area was so ripe for a burn um, and like what made it such that the fire was able to get so big so fast and, and burn for so long. Um, like what, how long had fire been excluded from this area? If that played a role, um, just that it, there hadn't been a burn there for a while. And what was the main fuel that was that was perpetuating all of this? Okay. Yeah, well, a lot of the area of the Calder Fire hasn't burned in, you know, decades, if not longer. We've got mapping of fire history, um, you know, from going back to the 1920s or so, and it captures most of the large fires. And most of the Calder footprint, there's just, there's not any big fires in there. And so there was a ton of fuel. And then we just had this incredibly dry um, last decade, really. And so that there was the forests also have been logged super heavily across that entire landscape. You know, once maybe not up in the in the highest of the high country, but like once you get down below, you know, like five thousand feet or so, there's been a huge amount of logging on the private timberland and the public lands, going back, you know, uh, into the early twentieth century. And so the forests are really thick with mainly younger trees. Mm. And so that when we saw the same thing on the Dixie fire, that we've just got this whole landscape that's got um, mainly trees that are say under, under 100 feet tall. And the old trees were taller and spaced out larger and more fire resilient. So it's kind of a triple whammy of fire suppression plus removing the biggest trees plus climate change and drought all coming together to give us these mega fires. And sort of zoning in specifically on the on this region of the Echo Lakes Basin. Um, because one of the things that we were all watching happen was it ended up going up sort of the, the northwest side of that slope really quickly. And then when it was burning downhill on the on the east side, um, northeast side it burned quite a bit slower and so I was wondering you know we've all heard fire burns faster uphill but what are all what are all the factors that go into that um and what are the implications of the difference in severity like will that will one side um look pretty different in the coming years than the other side how will it play out yeah yeah so the story of kind of how the fire got there and how it behaved on its way there, you know, it, it's all kind of driven by the weather and the topography. And so, you know, we're looking here at the Echo Lake um, Basin here, looking kind of west. And um, the fire really, fires like to run uphill and they like to run up canyons and they like to run downwind, right? So When you look at how the fire kind of moved up from Strawberry and Lover's Leap up Highway 50, it kind of had everything it needed to, to really um, make that run. You know, so Sierra Tahoe is kind of in the middle here. And the fire, like once it got established down here around um, Echo or around Lover's Leap at the bottom of the screen, it could kind of just blast up Highway 50 uh, with the wind and the terrain and everything pushing it. And another thing that we see is that um, the slopes that face south um, 
they get sun all day long. And so they're drier. The slopes that face north don't get as much sun you know, in a given day, and they don't get as much sun in the year. So they're cooler, they're moister. They just they take longer to dry out. So we all see fire run more aggressively on a south slope if it's, all things are equal. So that's why this whole side of um, between Echo Lake and Highway 50, that whole south facing slope, it was kind of in what we called the alignment of the fire. So the fire could kind of just rip up through there and it could run uphill and it could run downwind uh, altogether. And it was kind of backing into Echo Lake for days, right? Remember, like it took like almost a week really for the fire to, to get down this mountain, right? Right. And so that backing fire, like according to this imagery that I'm looking at here, um, you know, a lot of those trees didn't die in the Echo Lake Basin itself. We've been looking at this imagery for the Dixie Fire too, and it's been pretty good. You know, like it generally shows like where you have living trees and dead trees um, pretty well. So I'm sure there's a lot of dead trees on that slope, but it's not like um, the other side of the hill um, that was kind of in the direct run of the fire. The fire back downhill, and when that happens, it's usually a lot more kind of mild behavior. So you're kind of tucked in there, you know, out of the wind, out of the prevailing spread of the fire, and that was why the fire didn't just, you know, romp right through there in a day. Right. And so you mentioned that on that side of the hill, it seems like it's it was beneficial fire. What do you mean by that? What does that imply? Well, just this whole landscape used to have fire on a lot more regular basis. Um, less so at, up in the high elevations, but like it all kind of needs fire. And so if you can get fire that doesn't kill all the trees, um, that's kind of a win because we're still kind of out of whack with the fire that we get these big patches where everything's killed. And there's a lot of argument, you know, in fire science about how things have changed. Like if there's, um, if, you know, we naturally had, you know, big patches of high severity. So like, if you look at the whole fire overall, um, the red is areas where trees are all killed. So down here where the fire first started and made its big kind of catastrophic run that, you know, burn up grizzly flats and everything, all these trees are killed. There's a huge patch of dead forest that's going to, you know, there won't be any big trees there in our lifetimes. And so there's an argument in fire science about, well, did this, is this really like way out of, an, you know, um, is this a big anomaly, right? Or did this happen in the past? And it kind of changes as you move across the landscape, you know? So there's, as you get up into higher elevations, um, there's red fir forest and it didn't have fires frequently. And that's because of what we talked about earlier with, you know, the shade and the moisture and all the big snowpack and everything. There's a lot narrower window in the conditions to really support a big high severity fire in the high country. You know, there's a lot of rock, July or August. So you don't usually have a very big window for things to dry out enough for a fire to really burn in the high elevations. But we know that those areas have had fire. Um, they're just like on what we call a longer fire return interval. So maybe it burned every hundred years. Now we know that down around, you know, like Placerville, that a lot of this stuff burned every like 10 to 20 years. And so, so because this area used to burn so often and then we had suppression for so long, it was set up, it was way out of whack and it was set up for this big gnarly, like huge destructive burn that burned this, you know, tens of thousands of acres in one day. So when you get up to the higher country, like in general, like you see there's less red, right? Like there's always patches of green where the forest is still um, alive, right? There's still green needles on a lot of the trees out here. And so like, if you look at the whole fire, like over 50% of the area didn't have all the trees killed. You know, so I think it's always kind of, Striking like the media says, the Caldor fire devastated over 100,000 acres. And it's like, well, it didn't really. It, like, it burned over 100,000 acres. But like half of this land probably got a fairly beneficial burn, right? Where it cleared out a lot of the dead undergrowth. It killed a lot of the smaller trees that were creating thickets. And so 
a lot of this, you know, a lot of what you see from Highway 50 um, kind of on these north slopes as you drive up is still alive. And then obviously there's places where the fire kind of was in alignment and the weather was severe and the wind was blowing. And so like Sierra Tahoe, like it really got roasted and it's um, a negative thing for, you know, most humans um, probably find that to be a negative thing, right? Because it, it killed, it destroyed homes and it destroyed ski area and it, it killed all the trees. And so when I say we had some good fire at Echo Lake, it's just that a lot of those trees are still alive. And the fact that we got fire in there, like we probably got results here that were similar to what we would have accomplished with the prescribed burn, where we would have lit it at the top of the hill and let it back down the mountain slowly and kill some of the small trees, but not be so severe that it killed the big trees. So the fact that that all burned and it still has green trees, it, it buys a level of protection for the community there. And it also kind of gets that land back on track with a natural fire return kind of <laughs> interval. So, right. so when we get fires and it don't, they don't kill the trees, um, it's generally a good thing because we this land all needs fire and our capacity to put fire on the land with prescribed fire or anything else is super limited. And it's super unlikely that anyone is gonna really be able to pull off a prescribed burn there, um, even if people wanted it. Um, our, our capacity in general to do big prescribed burns is like, it, does, it doesn't exist, right? We talk about it, but if you tried to burn this in October, we already, we had snow. You know, if we try to burn it in November when the conditions are right, like there's three or four or five feet of snow here. So in a lot of ways, like we get some of our best fire treatment on the landscape during wildfires. Mm. And what is that beyond just being, sort of beyond these wildfires preventing future wildfires when they're not killing all the trees, what is the benefit for like the soil, for the environment in general, for the forest when you have these low severity burns? Yeah. Well, all the, the plants and everything have evolved with it, you know? Um, and the longer you go without fire, um, you know, the duff, or like the pine needles and all the material under the big trees, it it's, accumulates a really thick kind of layer. You know, like someone said, like, well, if you stood in the same place for like 200 years, like there'd be a big pile of crap around your feet too, right? Like if you just like shed your toenails and like hair and skin and everything, like you'd just be standing in this big pile. And trees are like that. So big old trees have this huge pile of, flaked off bark and pine needles and everything and now the problem is that a lot of that stuff gets so thick that um, the roots start to grow from the soil up into that duff layer and then if we do a prescribed burn and it's been so long we can kill the roots and then we can the tree can die so it's, it's really hard to it's hard to get that it's hard to do prescribed burning in places that haven't had fire for a long time and so just getting a fire, um, it takes care of that. And, it, it, and it, yeah, it kills a lot of the trees. It kills a lot of trees. When you look at these forests that are all dead, they're like, we killed all those 80 years ago when we started putting all the fires out, right? They've just been standing there. But like we initiated this kind of future condition with decisions we made you know, almost 100 years ago. And so now we're like, oh, man, climate change killed all these trees. And um, but like a lot of this stuff is just a consequence of mistakes we made 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? And so we can, like, one thing I've noticed, we go out and do some prescribed burns at a fairly small scale. And like, we'll rake like the duff back from all the big trees that we're gonna burn around. And it's a huge amount of work, even for like an acre. You know, like, we're not gonna get that done on the landscape scale. Like, we're not gonna, you know, it's just, it's way beyond our, the scale of our ability. So we're kind of stuck with like when we get a fire like Calder, we got a lot of good effects from it. And it, it's terrible that it um, burned down all these people's homes. Everyone was traumatized and evacuated and smoked out. And like, like there's all these bad things about the disaster for our communities. But as far as the health of the forests, um, we're just not getting it done otherwise, you know, like, and we're not gonna, you know, like, so 
there's a lot of talk about scaling up fuel treatment in California spending, you know, doing a million acres a year. It's just kind of the scale thing is like, I think what people don't really understand is that like, it takes a huge amount of effort just to like thin a hundred acres, but we've got like 30 million acres of forest in California. And so fire is really the only tool that scales, you know, that like, if the Calder fire had beneficial effects on 70,000 acres, you know, 10 times what we're treating an entire state a year with prescribed burning or, you know, so, okay. so no one really wants to, um, it's really difficult for us to use wildfire, like in a managed fashion, like the, as you see from the Tamarack fire, other fiascos were, were stripped down of resources and they decide we're just going to let this fire burn because it's not affecting anything. And then it blows up and it burns down the town or, something bad, you know, bad things happen. So there's way too many people in California for us to really seriously manage wildfire, you know, which means letting them burn. Like, there's nothing we could have done to put out the Calder fire or the Dixie fire, you know, like it wasn't for lack of trying that these fires got big. It's just that they're way beyond our scale of our ability to manage it. So when I say good fire, that you got good fire, it's like all things considered, you still got green trees and the forest is healthier now than it was before the fire in the Echo Lake base. Can you tell me a little bit about Echo Lake? You know, like I, I don't really know the place. I mean, what's your story with Echo Lake? Yeah. Um, it's this beautiful little set of lakes um, that they were actually connected. They're now connected by a ch channel that was um, a section of it was dynamited and then dredged um, quite a while back. And there's been cabins going in there. First cabin went in, I think, late 1870s. I feel bad because so many Echo Lakers are going to be watching this and they all know the history by heart. Um, but then we had cabins go in, you know, early 19 teens, all throughout. I think the last cabin went in 1988, around that time. And so you have all these like really tiny old little cabin in the woods style cabins. And they were really, they, it was part of this project, this, this government project to get lower income folks, um, middle-class folks out into, out into, you know, nature, the outdoors. Um, and so they made these leases for these cabins um, and they made them really accessible. So there's these, you know, community of folks who spend, the summer season into the fall out at the lake. Um, and then there's, it's also the portal to desolation wilderness. Um, and so a lot of folks come through and there's a taxi boat service run by the chalet um, that can get you to the upper lake. And then you can go out into desolation and, you know, go out to Lake Aloha and Pyramid Peak. Um, and yeah, it's a really, it's just a really vibrant place. The PCT runs through there. So we get a lot of traffic because of that. Um, and the community that lives around the lake is pretty tight. You know, my, one of our close friends are my grandmother and her great grandmother were also best friends. Um, and a lot of the kids that grow up on the lake end up working at the chalet um, or play some role. You know, they work with one of the contractors on the lake, play some role in the community. Um, we have a big like water games day, Echo Lakes day out at the upper lake. Um, so yeah, it's just a, a tight community up in the woods that goes that goes pretty far back. I really want to thank you for, for the work that you do with the lookout because I know so many people who relied on that and continue to rely on it. I really appreciate all the support we got. We got a lot of support from uh, especially Echo Lake. Perfect. All right. Well, um, great talking to you and good luck with your projects. And um, thanks for being interested in all this stuff.